All right, uh, so here's another kind of similar problem. Again, we have a box on a shifting path, but here somebody is pushing the box to start with. They're pushing it at an initial velocity of eight meters per second. Uh, we could say that this is a six kilogram box. Again, there's no friction. And um, we want to know how high is the box going to get on this portion of the path. So let's try to go through the systematic method from the handout. Let's just consult the steps step by step and try to go through that approach. So uh, when you're ready, what would we do first? <coughs> Identify it and label the initial and final points of the interval you are considering. So the initial point would be uh, at 11 meters where the box is drawn, and we're trying to figure out the final. Point. So let's label the final point. What would you label as the final point? Somewhere. We don't know exactly where the final point is, but we know it's going to be somewhere around here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a good start. Okay. Then. And then identify all forces on the object. <coughs> um, so again, we just have the weight and the normal force. And the normal force is always going to be perpendicular to the track, so there's not going to be any work done. Here's the weight. Here's the normal force. And weight is a conservative force, and the only non-conservative force is doing the work. Good, good. So it, um, <coughs> that's great. For completeness, we should draw the velocity vector. How, how would I draw the velocity vector here? Uh, perpendicular to the normal force. Right, or to start with, tangent to the path. Your velocity is always tangent to your path. And then once we've drawn the velocity tangent to the path, we discover that it's perpendicular to the normal force here. Okay, and this is not a force. I'm just putting it here so I can compare it to the other forces. All right, so it sounds like uh, you're doing good, so what then? <clears throat> so now we want to write in EI equals EF because there's no non Good. So our basic framework for this type of problem is this. But you've already figured out that the weight isn't doing any work that we would plug in here because the weight is conservative. And the normal force is non-conservative, but it's not doing any work because it's perpendicular to the motion. So you're right that this term is going to turn out to be 0. That gives us our basic conservation of energy equation. Good. So um, it starts out with the initial potential energy of 6 times uh, 9.8. Uh, so if the low, we can set the lowest thing as, H, as 7 meters as h equals 0. So then the height would only be 4 meters. So let's put that into our diagram so we don't forget. Right. So it sounded like you decided to call this the lowest height. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right, good. So, ui equals 6 times 9.8 times 4. Which is 235.2. So compared to this zero height, we started at four meters above that. <coughs> what did you get there? Uh, 235.2. And the units on that would be? Uh, joules. Good, so we can plug that in here for this energy, good. And then it starts out with an kin initial kinetic energy of one half times six times eight squared. 
mass of six. And uh, here we were given the initial speed of eight squared. Good. So it has the initial kinetic energy of 192. Good. Uh, and we don't know the height of the final position, so we can't really do that. So you can just leave it as um, 6 times 9.8 times h. So this would be the final potential energy. We know that the mass is 6. We know that g is 9.8. We don't know h final. Mm -hmm. Good. And then for the, so the kinetic, would the kin kinetic energy be zero because it goes up until it stops? All right. That's the hardest part of the problem, so it's good that you saw that. That's the thing that would tend to give people difficulty here. A final equals one half m v final squared. It looks like you worked that out. The question is, how high will the box get? What, what do they mean by how high will the box get? What they mean is, how high will the box get before it changes direction? Mm -hmm. Right now, say, the box would be, say, moving up. But eventually, it's going to run out of steam and then start moving back down again. Mm -hmm. And the highest point it's going to get is the point when it's just changing direction. And that's when the velocity equals zero. That's right. I don't think you and I have talked about that. But that's an important problem-solving technique. When you change direction, in the instant that you change direction, your velocity must be zero. I think I might have even included that somewhere in the handout, because that's so important for these types of problems. Yeah. In the instant that you're um, changing your direction, your velocity must be zero, and that means at that instant your kinetic energy is zero. Well, it's good that you figured that out, but that's the part to highlight here, because that's the part that would give people the most trouble. So what should we plug in for the final kinetic energy? Uh, zero. All right. That is tough for most people, because the problem never said that we were coming to rest. It's just implied in the question of asking how high will the box get. this off to 7.3 meters. Um, but as you were seeing, that just means 7.3 meters above what we've chosen as our zero height. But the problem probably wants us to treat this as zero, because that's what these numbers were in terms of. Um, so the answer would be this uh, plus 7, 14.3. So we're 4.3 meters above the ground, the way the ground was defined in these numbers over here. These numbers were defining this is the ground. That didn't mean we made a mistake by calling this the zero height, but we just had to remember to correct back to the original height when we put in this answer. And it wouldn't have made it our life that much more difficult, actually, in this case, to use uh, this as the zero height. To tell you the truth, actually, we didn't gain any benefit from this because we, weren't, we, never, we didn't care about this point. Right? Since we, we never actually plugged in anything about this point, there actually wasn't any benefit to calling this the zero height. So the problem would have been a little bit easier if we just stuck with this as the zero height. Doesn't make a big difference, but um, we're not focusing on this point anyway, so there's no point calling that the zero height. Um, you can see now that there was a, a little bit of a mistake in how we first drew our picture. Because I think you originally drew this point over here. Are we going to end up higher or lower than when we started? Uh, higher. Higher than when we started. That didn't uh, end up m messing us up here. But it turns out that we're going to be higher than where we started. That's something we should have been able to figure out all along. How should we know that we're going to end up higher than where we started? Well, um, here we have both kinetic and potential energy. Mm -hmm. But here, all the energy has been made into potential energy. 
Um, so um, we're, because we're so we're changing our kinetic energy into potential energy, so we should be able to get higher than we started. So that's again one of the advantages of this conservation of energy approach. It should have allowed us to already have a qualitative answer before we even do the calculations. If we remember that at the highest point, all our kinetic energy is gone. Well, it must all have gone into height, into potential energy. So we have to end up higher than where we started. That's how, the, by the way, that's how we know that we're even going to get here. How do we know that we're not going to stall out over here, for example? Well, we know that we're not going to stall out over here because this is at a lower height than this over here. We're always going to have enough energy to get over a height that's lower than where we started. The only time that we can stall out is when we have the potential to get to a higher height than where we started. 